Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube page. Thanks so much for watching. Today I'm going to be analyzing the astrological charts of Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg. And I'm also going to be talking about some things that they share in common in relation to their astrological charts. So I'm going to start with Bill Gates. So he has his sun sign in Scorpio. And Scorpio is that fixed water sign. Scorpio is all about determination and preservation. And a lot of times people with their sun sign in Scorpio have this strong need for secrets. So what we're seeing in Bill Gates is we're definitely seeing a lot of secrecy going on and a lot of kind of energy like brewing under the surface, so to speak, in relation to that Scorpio sun sign. Now, Bill Gates also has his Venus and Saturn in Scorpio as well. So Scorpio has a lot to do with the energy put on to other people. Scorpio is really all about that time in one's life when they are very aware that life is not going to go on forever. And so there's this strong need to um, either accumulate desire and possessions or a strong need to sort of lean on to other people energetically for, um, you know, for whatever they're needing to get out of this. When we think of the creature, the vampire, we sort of think of the energy of Bill Gates a little bit. It's almost kind of like this succubus that's kind of like leeching onto other people's energy. So we see that definitely with his Venus in Scorpio. And his Venus is sitting right next to the planet Saturn. So when we get Venus and when we get Saturn, you know, we get Venus's relationships and Saturn is really all about hard, cold rigidity and the energy of Saturn is, is very much blocked and contained. So when we think of people that have a Venus-Saturn conjunction or a Venus-Saturn aspect, we think of Donald Trump, the CEO of Amazon or the ex-CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos. You know, we're, we're, we're thinking of these people that take the aspect in the heart of Venus, right? And put it next to Saturn and Saturn sort of puts it in a small little container and diminishes it. A lot of times those with a Venus Saturn see people as commodity and, and really have kind of a bit of a power trip in relation to people and commodity. So a Venus Saturn is kind of a hard cold aspect. Now, the energy of Scorpio is not all bad. There's a lot of intuition and insight in Scorpio as well. He has a, his sun sign sitting next to the planet Neptune. A sun-Neptune conjunction is highly creative, can be somewhat spiritual, and also visionary in their outlook. The planets like Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto in the astrology chart have a lot to do with the masses. So that being said, Neptune has a lot to do with the collective unconscious. So when you have the sun sign, which is the ego structure, sitting next to the planet Neptune, which stands for the collective unconscious, that's this great ability to be able to tap into the collective unconscious. However, Neptune can be prone to delusion, illusion, fantasy. There can also be precognition around the energies of Neptune as well. So what we're seeing with Bill Gates in relation to this Sun-Neptune conjunction is def we're definitely seeing the ability to be able to reach the masses. However, because he has all these planets in Scorpio as well, there is almost a bit of an underlying science fiction aspect in relation to a lot of these aspects. And we know that a lot of stuff that Bill Gates says and does maybe is not for the highest good. And there's also some level of fantasy going on because folks, we have a Sun-Neptune conjunction. It, that energy very much operates on a fantasy world. So what I'm seeing with Bill Gates is he has a strong moon placement. The moon stands for the emotions. He has this moon sitting on the midheaven. The midheaven is the highest point in the astrological chart and his midheaven is an Aries and his moon is an Aries, showing that his sun sign is in an in conjunct aspect to his moon sign. So they're in an aspect of non-relation. We get the sun sign in Scorpio, that's fixed water. We get the moon sign in Aries, that's cardinal fire. An in conjunct aspect is an aspect that's non-relation. And so what he's needing to do, he's needing to constantly make adjustments 
in his consciousness to try to synthesize his ego structure as represented by the sun sign and the moon sign as represented by the emotions. Scorpio is very calculating and very deep. Aries is very impulsive and very rash. So he sort of has this combination. And with that moon sign there and Aries sitting on the midheaven, which is the high point in the chart, you know, the moon is how how we take in information in our mind and how our mind stores the information. It's the subconscious, the subconscious mind and the emotions. So that being said, the moon in Aries, you know, is very independent. It's all about travel. It's all about action. There's not a lot of what's the word? Kind of a Spartan environment, so to speak. So the the, the moon in Aries more of views life as it's a bit of a battleground. It can sort of dramatize things because the moon likes a soft, cushy environment. And when it's in a in a sign that's ruled by Mars, it it goes to show that perhaps he didn't have the best relationship with his mother. So what I'm also seeing here, he has a moon opposition Mars as well. So he has this constant strife, constant need for engagement, sort of a constant battle. This can also make a very competitive nature as well. His Mars is in Libra. Mars in Libra likes to jump into relationship dynamics really quickly without thinking. And he has a lot in his fourth house as well. The fourth house is, is all about the early childhood home and family environment where the first emotional patterns were laid down. He has See, he has four planets sitting there. He has a Mars-Mercury conjunction and then that Neptune-Sun conjunction. A Mars-Mercury conjunction is all about rash speech. Mars is the god of war. It's Mars is our energy. Mercury is all about the communications. So a Mercury-Mars can be forceful and dynamic in their speech. And again, that Sun-Neptune can create fantasy worlds out of everything. So he has all this going on again in that fourth house, early childhood home and family environment. So the fourth house is really about the roots and the foundation of the personality, showing that he has a rich inner world and a rich inner environment. And that because his moon sign is on the midheaven, he's able to reflect all that back. He's able to reflect the collective unconscious. He's able to reflect the unconscious motivations of humanity and others in relation in relation to that Aries moon sign. So he has his Chiron in the seventh house. Chiron is all about the wounded healer. What are once our wounds hopefully were wise and evolved enough to be able to heal. His Chiron is in the seventh house. The seventh house really has to do with relationships and you know, you in relation to someone else. Having a Chiron there indicates either a missing parent or an unemotionally parent, you know, a, a parent that was unemotional and didn't really care about his feelings. So what he did was he retreated into his own private fantasy world as representation by that strong fourth house. And so I would bet, you know, he was probably a bit of an awkward child growing up, you know, probably really went a lot into his own fantasy world, you know, to try to soothe his woundings. That Chiron also sits in the astrological sign of Aquarius. It's sitting at zero degrees Aquarius. Zero degrees of a sign, it's like the most pure sort of, it's like the introduction to that sign. And Aquarius is all about groups and friends and friendships. So this really shows that he felt like he was an outsider. He felt like he didn't belong. And a lot of his wounds revolve around him not feeling like he doesn't belong and then retreating into a private fantasy world. So we really see that spilling out into his adulthood, you know, in, represent in representation by that Chiron aspect. This guy also has a bit of a power complex. The reason why I say power complex is because he has the planet Pluto, which is all about power. It's sitting right next to Jupiter and whatever's sitting next to Jupiter, it blows it up. So a Pluto-Jupiter conjunction indicates power mania. It's sitting in his second house in the astrology chart. The second house is all about the material resources and the material... Um, and the material world and finances. So he uses his 
his resources and his finances as a means to have power. This isn't the most evolved way to use that. However, it is in an, his Pluto, Jupiter is in an inconjunct, meaning a non-relational aspect to his Chiron. So that means he is constantly having to adjust, right? And constantly having to make compromise and constantly utilizing his his Jupiter Pluto conjunction to have powers power over others and to try to heal his his wounds and his um and his Chiron complex that he has. Okay, so that is my astrological analysis of Bill Gates. Okay, so here is Mark Zuckerberg's astrology chart. So Mark Zuckerberg is a sun sign Taurus, a moon sign Scorpio, and a Sagittarius rising. So his chart is strongly characterized by a polarity of Taurus and Scorpio energies. And with Taurus, where it's all about accumulation of resources, accumulation of wealth, accumulation of money, accumulation of property, accumulation of things. A lot of planets in Taurus, they indicate the need for stability and finding that strength through their material stability. Now, opposite of that, we have Scorpio. And Scorpio is all about other people's resources. It's all about taboo. It's all about power struggles. And Scorpio is really all about accepting or having to accept the loss of material things. And so what happens here in this polarity they they kind of play off each other, right? And there tends to be one, there tends to be a deep need for material security within this polarity as represented by the accumulation of Taurus and then the being afraid to lose that stuff as representation by Scorpio. So, he has his moon sign in Scorpio, he has the planet Mars in Scorpio and he has the planet Saturn in Scorpio. So the moon stands for the emotions and the subconscious mind in how you know yourself on a personal level. The moon in Scorpio is intense and passionate and very driven. Scorpio is a water sign and it's of the fixed element. So when you get water and when you get fixed, you think of psychologically deep and psychologically motivated and very driven. Scorpio is all about having to eventually accept the loss of of things. So that being said, it's kind of like the vampire, as I mentioned with Bill Gates and a lot of his Scorpio qualities. The energies of Scorpio, they tend to like to, to research, to investigate, to dig things up. So on one level, Scorpio is really all about extraction. And on another level, it's it's really all about um, the the need and the desire to be um, almost kind of like a succubus upon other people's energies. You know, each sign plays out many different le levels. And because he has the moon sign there, that has to do with the emotions. And those with a moon in Scorpio, you know, it, it wasn't easy growing up. You know, there's a lot of intensity around the mother and a lot of issues around the mother. You know, definitely with a Scorpio moon. His moon is sitting next to the planet Mars, showing violent outbursts, showing volatile emotions, <clears throat> and also showing a very competitive nature as well. And that's sitting next to the planet Saturn as well. Saturn next to the moon is not a great spot because Saturn negates the emotions of the moon. When you think of the moon, you want emotions. You know, you want softness. Um, and a moon Saturn sort of it's it kind of like it it makes the emotions like rigid and it, it you know it really creates a sense of rigidity and when mars is sitting next to saturn that can be repressed anger um you know leading to violent outbursts mars sitting next to saturn is never comfortable mars is the energy saturn kind of represses that so this basically this is almost like uh, a volcano that is about ready to combust at all times with this aspect. This is all sitting his in his 11th house, this Scorpio stellium. And remember, a stellium is three or more planets that are sitting right next to each other that create a, a 
blended unit of, of energy and power. So this is energy and power to his disposal. And the 11th house is all about community and all about groups. And so he has his moon here. So he's reflecting that intense Scorpio energy onto groups. But what happens here is because Scorpios really correspond with the 8th house. And the 8th house has a lot, a lot to do with death and rebirth. And with death, we get losses. So there's definitely inevitable gains, you know, and inevitable losses as represented by that Scorpio energy in the 11th house. Now, sitting opposite of that 11th house is his 5th house where he has his Taurus sun sign and he has Venus in Taurus as well. The sun sign in Taurus is really, again, as I mentioned, all about the material possessions. Venus in Taurus, it likes to live a good life. Venus is all about aesthetics. It's all about luxury and and um, can be very opulent with the Venus in Taurus, can be very materialistic as well. So his sun sign and, Ven and his Venus are in the fifth house, which is all about creative self-expression the fifth house rules the astrological sign of leo and the fifth house also rules the sun so the fifth house is all about children speculation gambling amusement play so this guy you know he he loves to be he loves to play and he might like to speculate he might like to gamble who knows but he kind of has the the bling bling thing going on you know and is definitely attracted towards Kind of being a wheeler dealer, you know, kind of flashing his ego, perhaps, you know, with the, with the sun sign and Venus in the fifth house. So let's see here. He has his south node in the twelfth house. And remember, the nodes are the evolutionary karmic directional points in the astrology chart. The south node stands for what you have under your belt, what you're used to. Um, what's easy for you, but it's not really pointing you in your evolutionary direction that you need to grow this lifetime. So he has that self node in Sagittarius, sitting next to the planet Uranus. Sagittarius is, the energies of Sagittarius are kind of like, peace out, I'm going to go travel and kind of expand my horizons. And, you know, so it's very easy for him to like, when something's not working to maybe sort of like peace out a little bit, you know, or or to try to like cover up by doing something different um, and going through some sort of metamorphosis or change. And the reason why I'm saying that is because we know that he got in trouble with all this Facebook stuff. And so then he goes to change the name to Meta. So he's not actually curing the problem, but he's more sort of like covering over the problem. And, you know, that could definitely be that south node sitting next to the planet Uranus. Uranus wants to kind of change things, you know. So that also being said, you know, he, you know, that, that south node sitting next to Uranus, which, which is change, you know, there's going to be a lot of sudden change and, and upheaval for him. And that, because that is in the 12th house, you know, it's all really about the idea of like letting things go downstream. It's his past ghost and his past karma coming to kind of bite him in the butt as represented by that 12th house south node. Sitting opposite of that 12th house south node is the north node in the 6th house. So the sixth house is a north node karmic direction. The sixth house rules a wide variety of things. The sixth house can rule, you know, rules health, service, creating a mind, body, spirit. But the sixth house in Vedic astrology also rules enemies and karmic debts. So having that north node in the sixth house can indicate that he's creating more enemies and creating more karmic debts for himself as he goes along in life. So he has uh, his Pluto in a really prominent position in his astrology chart, which we wouldn't be surprised. Pluto rules power. It's sitting in his 10th house, which is the house of career. So that being said, he holds a prominent position of power. His Pluto is in retrograde in his astrology chart. And a Pluto retrograde indicates a spilling over of a misuse of power and in either a former life or or a spilling in a misuse of power in um you know in in your formative years or in your early on years and so thus you are really aware of of power dynamics and you can either get caught up in them or 
or you're also given the opportunity to have the awareness to rise above those power dynamics. Um, however, though, in his evolution, he is still really caught up in those power dynamics because Pluto is sitting opposed Mercury and Mercury is all about communications. I'm sorry, it's it's not in an oppositional aspect. It's, it's in a Quinn Cunx aspect. And that is an aspect um, of non-relation in an aspect of adjustment. So he's constantly thinking of the many ways in which he could utilize his power and his position of power in relation to his communication. He's constantly needing to be in that position of power, but he's constantly being called out on, on it. And with that aspect of communication, he's constantly needing to readjust himself to to give himself the his own power gratification. So Mercury, his Mercury is in Aries. Aries is the first sign. It's strong willed. It's it's really all about independence. So his communication comes across as strong, forceful. Aries is really all about me. However, a Mercury and Aries, you know, can sometimes put their foot in their own mouth because Aries, you know, being the first sign, it's ruled by the head and Aries energy likes to sort of jump into things head first without thinking. And what's interesting here is he has this Mercury in Aries, right? Which, which is so, which is so quick thinking, right? And, or should I say impulsive, right? This impulsive communication, but then he has all this Taurus and all this Scorpio, Scorpio acts behind the scenes to plot things out and Taurus just plot plots things out. So he may come across in his communication as this sort of impulsive rash guy. However, though, his chart would say otherwise, you know, he's very much a plotter, extremely, extremely security oriented, extremely material oriented as well. He has his Jupiter in the first house and you know, a, 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 a Jupiter in the first house, you know, comes across as, as someone who has good moral character. However, with him, you know, we are definitely seeing, seeing different here. And what, because he has his Jupiter in retrograde, Jupiter stands for your morals. And when it's in retrograde, one tends to develop their own set of morals, their own set of moral compass. And so what we're really seeing with him here is he is very much gone on his own path as represented by the Jupiter in the first house because the first house represents your independent action and he's gone on to create his his own moral set of moral compass um which is kind of you know which which is not the best it's pretty low actually and he also has the planet Neptune in the first house as well he has his Neptune in retrograde as well as I mentioned his Jupiter in retrograde Neptune in retrograde on its high aspect can become very spiritual and very selfless and very giving on its low aspect and neptune and retrograde can get really caught up in their own delusions and what we're seeing with him with this neptune and retrograde is he's very much caught up in his own delusions and because it's in the first house he's gonna any independent action he takes he's gonna come up with these sort of fantasy ideas about things you know the meta the wearing the mask the living in the 3d world you know he's going to come up with with his own sort of neptunian ways of trying to escape and doing things and a lot of them are going to come across as kind of delusional maybe a little visionary around the edges but for the most part pretty delusional and kind of out to lunch what he's attempting to do here is he's he's a he has a bit of a rich fantasy world and he's tempting to resolve that fantasy world, you know, through some of his past wounds. We see we see this with Bill Gates as well. You know, we see this parallel. So his midheaven is in Libra. Midheaven is the high point in the astrological chart. Libra is very much reliant and dependent upon other people to make his decisions. So even though, you know, he has a he's very strong strong will in his communication with his Mercury and Aries, his midheaven in Libra goes to show you that when it comes to taking actions as far as his career, he doesn't really take independent action. He really talks it out and relies on someone else to give him feedback, most likely his wife, you know, or some someone along those lines. Okay, so that was my 
astrological analysis of Mark Zuckerberg and the most important aspects of his astrology chart. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for the next. Bye.